Will, thanks for being on with us. And for people like Stugatz who do not want to do the reading and certainly don't want to go over the paywall because they've used up all their free stuff at the Washington Post, can you tell us what it is that you reported yesterday on Daniel Snyder and where he finds himself sort of on the fringes of owning his football team, but interfering with things like an NFL investigation. And again, thank you for joining us. No, this is my pleasure. Uh, so yesterday's story was about several instances over the course of the last year and change in which lawyers and private investigators uh, working on Mr. Snyder's behalf did things that uh, were perceived by people trying to speak to the NFL as attempts to interfere with the investigation. And I think chief of these is there is this woman who in 2009 accused Dan of an act of sexual misconduct, uh, who settled with the team for $1.6 million. And last year, when the NFL's investigator, Beth Wilkinson, tried to interview this woman, her attorney alleges that Dan Snyder's legal team offered her more money if she agreed not to speak to Beth Wilkinson. Uh, obviously, important to note that Mr. Snyder's lawyers forcefully deny that allegation. What are the consequences of interfering with an NFL investigation? Uh, none. None. Um, uh, and I, mean, I think it's an important distinction to make is that I think the, the folks the NFL would argue that regardless of what attempts were made, Beth Wilkinson, the NFL's investigator, was able to interview everyone she wanted to interview ultimately and was able to do all the work she needed to do. Uh, and, um, you know, the outcome of that investigation, we don't know because Roger Goodell has kept it entirely confidential. So because... They weren't successful in buying or intimidating their way out of it because they weren't successful. There is no punishment for it. I, I don't know the NFL's reasoning because they've never released a report. Um, and we don't know what this lawyer concluded with regard to either what this woman said happened in 2009 between her and Dan or how the NFL's lawyer viewed all the things we wrote about yesterday, all these efforts that potential witnesses for this investigation viewed as attempts to interfere with, with her work. Will, what can you tell us about the NFL not giving Washington Post reporters access to much of anything and how you report a story around someone as powerful as Daniel Snyder, who has all manner of means of keeping things, information out of your hands? I mean, reporting into and around Daniel Snyder is among the most difficult things we've had to do in, in my time in the Post, just because of the tremendous amount of fear that people who've worked for him or who've done business with him have, because of you know, things you wrote about yesterday. He drags people into court, he sends PIs after people, and it's just, um, it, it, is, it brings a degree of stress that um, I'm glad that story is done and no longer part of my day-to-day -day living. What kind of hardships were real for you in this? You really thought that uh, you you thought you were in some peril, or or just that there would be active interference from the shadow world? It's primarily. I mean, Dan's a very litigious person, so writing any story about you know Dan, uh, you have to weigh every word in a way. I mean, I, I, we spent weeks with like nine part zooms with lawyers and editors just dissecting every word in the story um, in anticipation that, you know, we would could someday be in a courtroom having to explain our decisions. Hey, Will, it's Kate here. I was wondering, can you take us through what trying to connect with a source would be like on a story like this when you say, you know, Dan Snyder is such a litigious person in the shadow world and all of that stuff. Can you take us through actually trying to get a source to go either on the record or help you on this story? It's not just that, Will. I've heard the story for 30 years, right, as as Snyder was buying up media empires, that he was making his way through that city in a way that everybody fears him in that city because he could cause for you headaches you did not want in your life. Right. I mean, you know, I think ultimately the, the best sources for this stuff have been, you know, these women who uh worked for the team and you know endured different degrees of traumatic experiences and and want him held accountable so i think you know for all the stress and trouble it's been the last year and change has been probably easier than in years past because you know we can make argument to people who 
have information about Dan or have documentation relevant to our reporting pursuits that look, you know, there are a lot of women who came forward who, I mean, we're not talking about, you know, billionaires or millionaires. We're talking about, you know, 20 something, 30 something year old women who had, you know, relatively low paying jobs at the team who want this man held accountable and want some degree of transparency from the NFL. And it's not happening. And it's not the, the only way to increase the likelihood of it happening is to keep the pressure on with stories like the one we published yesterday. Will, can you take us inside of some of the newspaper's other reporting into this investigation that we do not know what the NFL has learned about Daniel Snyder and his environment, but we have learned through the Washington Post's reporting, I don't know if it was your reporting, what this culture was like. We do have a pretty good idea of what some of the more damning details are. At least the at least the tip of the iceberg. Right. You know, I mean, yeah, it's funny. I was reading some of the commentary on our journalism last year, and I think there was a degree of like, well, this just happens in professional sports. You know, it's a, it's a male-dominated universe. It's just a rough place for men and women to work. And, you know, there are a number of women we interviewed who work for the Washington football team but then went to work for other professional sports teams who said, no, it, it, it was, there was a particularly acute and uh, a discriminatory and um, abusive culture in that organization. Um, so, you know, and, and, and it's just... You know, we had the one detail we had in yesterday's story about how Dan Snyder was offended that Bruce Allen, who he just fired, had not sent him a text message congratulating him on hiring Ron Rivera. I mean, that, that's in line with the sort of the degree of sort of petty, bullying, abusive behavior we reported on previously. I think one of our first, first stories last year, you know, there was a top executive of Dan's for years who'd been a college cheerleader. And um, it was just an ongoing joke. Dan would make him like do cartwheels on occasion in, uh, in, you know, board meetings, just, you know, to get his rocks off. The detail that you're mentioning there about Dan Snyder, that is Dan Snyder was willing to go to court over. He, he was willing to have, he wanted contractually. It stated that Bruce Allen had to congratulate him by text for the hiring of Ron Rivera. Yeah. The, the timeline is that Dan fires Bruce hires Ron, learned that Bruce Allen had just sent Ron a very nice text, like, hey, man, congrats on the hire, or congrats on the job. And Dan got pissed that he didn't also get a text from Bruce saying, congrats on hiring Coach Ron Rivera. So um, the team used the pandemic to try to get out of paying Bruce what it owed him on his contract. And as they were resolving it, uh, Bruce's legal team got a text from one of Dan's lawyers that said, um, you know, something effective. Hey, I mean, I understand Mr. Allen, Mr. Snyder have reached terms. And I also understand Mr. Allen has agreed to send Mr. Snyder a text saying congrats on the hire. Uh, and this is in July. This is now seven months after he'd hired Ron Rivera. And uh, Bruce, they, they resolved the pay dispute. Bruce never sent that text. It's my understanding, at least. For the uninitiated, uh, can you just take people through what it is that you kind of hit glancing there where Washington was particularly frat boy on the edge of all wrong, even based on what could be stereotypically mad men male environments. You're saying the way the Washington Post's reporting suggests that this is beyond the pale in terms of being a toxic culture, and we are not getting the details from a transparent investigation from the NFL, correct? Right. Right. You know, I mean, there has been previous journalism about the treatment of cheerleaders, and, and we've done some stories about that also. But, uh, you know, it, it was apparently a place where this treatment was also directed at, you know, women like sales executives. Um, I remember one woman telling me that she had been, her boss had implored her to uh, to get breast implants. And it said, it said to her, you know, if you're ever interested in getting breast implants, I know a doctor who gives us a deal on the cheerleaders and, and can make that happen for you. Uh, and you know, for a lot of these women, these were just, um, damaging experiences that they, they experienced, you know, it was thought it's the first job out of college. And so it's, this is an introduction to them of what I guess they're, is this, is this how the world works? Is this how I'm going to be treated everywhere else I work? And, and for some of them, it had, you know, severe, um, impact on their career arcs. Is there much more egregious than the reported details on the cheerleaders feeling, 
um, at these retreats, like uh, they were being passed around like escorts or there were obligations or responsibilities that came with the job. Are there many details worse than those that, again, are simply the reporting of the Washington Post because the NFL doesn't want you to see any of this? Right. I mean, there's not nothing more egregious than that that we've reported. But I can say that Beth Wilkinson, you know, the attorney that uh, was initially hired by the team and then the NFL took over her investigation, she interviewed a lot of people who wouldn't speak to us um, because they were they were afraid. They were afraid of going public. So, you know, I, I do believe there is information in her reporting that we're not aware of that, you know, is currently just being kept under wraps by the NFL. Well, where do you or where does the Post go from here in terms of continuing to report on Dan Snyder? I mean, you know, we're very interested in what was alleged to have happened uh, on Dan's plane in 09 and how the team responded. And, you know, we're very interested in, in what Beth Wilkinson concluded with regard to a number of allegations involving Dan. And um, there are, I'm certain, people out there and, and documents that um, add details to that and answer some of those questions. So we'll we'll, we'll keep looking. Can you tell us when you say, I'm glad to be done with this part of the story, there's a risk involved in all of this, right? I mean, as you do all these lawyer calls and everything else, uh, you are, you're, you're finding yourself, these are no fun because you have to get so much of this stuff vetted and people are afraid to talk to you. So this story, when I ask you, Bezos is reportedly interested in, owning the Washington football team, the reporting of the Washington Post, which he owns, uh, can help put pressure on Snyder. And yet your journalistic arm without any word from Bezos would simply be doing this work because you're the hometown paper and this needs to be investigated. Right. I mean, there's been a rumor around this since the start. I think Dan is, I think people close to Dan have spread it, that our work is all just Jeff Bezos is sicking us on Dan so he can buy the, the team. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, fundamentally false. I've never spoken. Actually, it's not true. I've spoken to Jeff Bezos once. Um, he was coming out of the bathroom once when he visited the Post a few years ago. And I bumped into a security guard. Uh, he has no role or influence in our journalism. And um, frankly, it would be kind of a nightmare for me if he owned a team. Because every story I would write about the team would have to have this huge disclaimer that, by the way, the guy who pays my paycheck um, also owns the team I'm writing about right here. How have you navigated the difficulties in the journalism here? Because what I have seen in some of the reporting that gets done around this, whether it's Ronan Farrow that we're talking to or someone else who has invested in making sure that some of these details get into the light out of the darkness, the, these women are trusting you with something when they talk to you. These women are, are scared that they're going to be made victims yet again by the system punishing them. And you, uh, you have to walk around uh, trying to honor their stories, correct? It's not necessarily advocacy journalism, but it's not exactly impartial either, right? I mean, I would disagree with that. I mean, there are, um, you know, it's like anything. We just we just do the best job to ascertain what we think happened, what what is supportable we can put in a story, and then you know we fact check it and, and lawyer it. Uh, there are certainly women who've come forward and spoken to us with allegations that we didn't put in stories because. But, you know, they didn't didn't line up with other things we were hearing or we didn't, you know, we just had some some questions we couldn't quite answer. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's it's like any other story we do. And the nice thing about working at The Post is that there's a lot of editors and a lot of lawyers and a lot of smart people other than me on these calls who are invested in making sure the stories are accurate and defendable. Well, I don't think people understand just how much vetting goes into writing this kind of story when you're trying to avoid a litigious rich person. But can you explain to us, if I was having an honest conversation with you around the bar about what you think happened versus what you reported, if you were saying every rumor that you had heard that you believed to be true, but you couldn't make so true that the lawyers would allow you to do it, that place was the worst, was it not? Like by any by any standard, what the NFL would reveal in a transparent investigation is, oh my God, this is so much worse than what even you would consider NFL frat house behavior. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's part of the, I think, you know, there are people who believe that's part of the reason why the NFL has handled this the way it has. Um, you know, it's no, it's no secret that Dan has not managed the Washington football team in a way that's beneficial to the NFL. They don't make, as much money as the team does not make as much money as it should. 
And uh, he and his ownership have been uh, repeated instances of just bad public relations for the league. Uh, but he has a very Trumpian reputation, and there, there is a belief that if they actually tried to force him out, he would sue every last one of them, and it would just be an absolute nightmare. So it's, you know, the juice is not worth the squeeze, as the saying goes. Is that where we are with this, that the reason that Snyder will not be gone and has whatever this role is now, because explain, please, the role that he is functioning in now where he's off to the side of the team, but his his wife is runs the team. Like, I don't even understand what it is. You're telling me that that is just the purgatory that these sides are existing in because these other NFL owners are terrified that he's just going to sue them and then all of them are going to end up getting deposed on shit? That, that that's a belief and i think the, the the best phrase for what's going on with dan right now is he's in double secret probation um he is like technically he's off the record punished by the league and uh his lawyers claim not suspended and can can show up in the office whenever he wants but he hasn't shown up at the office tanya his wife is uh, running the team nominally and represent the team at meetings like the league owners meetings this week are they ever going to take his team? Or are you saying, no, if they haven't taken it already, they're not going to take it. If they're going to take the hit of hiding the investigation and this nightmare and then throw it all at Gruden, no, this is the end of it. There's a very high bar for uh, forcing uh, uh, an NFL owner to sell his team. Uh, really, any owner. I mean, I think Mark Cuban, won on the Donald Sterling scandal, Mark Cuban expressed concern about this is kind of a slippery slope. Um, and... Um, yeah, so I think the only example I can think of is Eddie DeBartolo, and there were like federal criminal charges there. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's it's a pretty high bar, and um, I would not be surprised if um, you know, Dan continues on the team and passes it on to his kids as, as he plans. Let me put it to you another way, Will, as I get you out of here. If you could report the story that gets Dan Snyder gone, are you telling me there is no such story? Like short of, you know, something c criminal, you're telling me nothing could be reported about this franchise that the fear of him litigating all the other owners in to play will result in anything substantively punitive. I mean, I can only report, you know, what, what is accurate and what I can corroborate. Um, but what, you know, what I can tell you is that Dan has a litigious reputation and there's a very hard bar out there for forcing an NFL owner to sell his team. And, um, yeah, it almost doesn't matter what gets reported. He's going to that. He's got so much power and money that he can, he can withstand anything basically short of like, I think these would be great crescents for Roger Goodell. You guys should line him up. One <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, did you feel like you were being interrogated? I'm sorry. It was excellent work that you did. And I wanted people to appreciate, uh, that I don't, I really don't think people understand the amount of vetting. How how long did you have to work on that story? What kind of nightmare was that story in your life? How how much did you grow to hate that story? I've been speaking to my editors and lawyers more than I've been speaking to my wife or daughter for the last week. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, but thank you for the reporting that you did on this story, and thanks for tolerating us. It's my pleasure, Dan. Thanks.